Hello and welcome back to Familiar Evil's YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to be diving deeper into the Astral Venturer's Guide from the new Spelljammers uh, collection. I'm not going to be going into like 100% detail because that would just be insane, but we're primarily just going to be looking at the character races in here and just seeing what they can do. And briefly going over some of the magic items, which admittedly aren't a lot, and some of the spell jammer ships. So let's quickly, let's just go ahead and get started rather than beating around the bush. Uh, let's start with. You can see a lot of this stuff that I've already talked about. Let's start with the backgrounds real quick. Let me see what these are about. So you got the Astral Drifter here. I'm gonna try one more time. I hope this is the last time in these videos that I have to do this because I really want you to be able to see my gorgeous face. I'll have to just like tape this to its spot in the future. I think this is, all right, that works for now. I'll do something or tape it for the next video. So professional. So Astral Drifter. For longer than you can remember, you have traversed the astral plane as I learned to speak. There, you experienced firsthand the wonders of the silver void. You stopped again. Eight, you stopped aging. You no longer felt hunger or thirst, driven by wanderlust. You drifted from one part of the astral sea to another. Like a mote of dust on the wind, you have lost count of the decades that have passed since you arrived here. In your travels, you have camped on the petrified hulks of dead gods and narrowly escaped the psychic winds that sweep across the astral sea while also avoiding prolonged contact with the plane's most dangerous denizens. <clears throat> I find it a little weird that you can be a incalculably old individual and still start at level one. <laughs> it's just... It's one thing I've always thought was hilarious about elves. It's like, how can you go through say like 300 years of your life and still be level one you get insight and religion on here in two languages of your choice from but they do suggest celestial or gith that's interesting i guess i mean that would make sense they're basically saying hey like celestial and gith are extremely common languages you should probably have them you get your typical traveler's clothes, a diary, an ink pen, a bottle of ink, and a pouch containing ten gold pieces. I feel like you could have had something more interesting in there, but that's fine. Not a gripe. Longevity, you are 20d6 years older than you look. Hmm. Because you have spent that much time in the astral sea without aging. Have a divine contact? That's interesting. You gain the mag magic initiate feed. That is huge. Just get the magic initiate feed. And you must choose a cleric feat for that. In the Astral Sea, you crossed paths with wandering deity. The encounter was brief and non-violent, yet it made a lasting impression on you. This deity saw fit to share one secret or obscure bit of cosmic lore. Work with your DM to determine the details of knowledge and impact of the campaign. Roll on the Divine Contact table to determine which deity you encounter, or work with your DM to identify a more suitable choice. That's, uh... Huh. Yeah, so they still have all the... Favorable Gods, Corlon, Kenora. Alright. That's, uh, that's interesting. <clears throat> I like it. Then you get a wild spacer, which I, I guess is probably like a an outlaw. That's my first boom right there. You got it. This, this is what I'm expecting this to be. You are raised in the void of wild space, home to asteroid miners, moon farmers, and other hardy folk. Perhaps you grew up in the far flung settlements such as Rock and Brawl, described in chapter three, or spent your uh, your early years on a crew of a spell jamming ship, performing helpful chores such as swabbing the deck, loading, offloading cargo, and scrapping the barnacles off the hole. Whatever your history in life, the wild space has toughened you so well that you are as brave as a miniature giant space hamster when it comes to facing the terrors and other challenges of airless night. You get athletics and survival. 
proficiency with navigators tools uh, for space vehicles equipment a bailing pin which is a club a set of traveler's clothes grappling hook 50 feet of hemp and rope and a pouch containing 10 gold pieces what do you get close encounter you have a harrowing encounter with the uh, wild spaces many terrors you escaped with your life but the encounter left you with a scar or two or perhaps a reoccurring nightmare Roll on the close encounter table and determine which creature got nearly got the best of you. Creatures marked with asterisks appear in Blue's Astral Menagerie. The others are described in the Monster's Manual. Or I'm assuming also in Warren Canaan's Monsters in the Multiverse. So you get a list here ranging from Beholders, uh, Lunar Dragons, Void Scavers, or Scavers, Vampirates. Wild space adaptation, you gain the tough feet. So, another feat that's interesting. That they're just, I, I kind of like it. I think that'd be nice if they just gave a feat to every uh, one of these. And maybe that's starting, that's going to become more of a common theme with the DD books and probably 5.5. They might update the backgrounds because that's that's pretty cool. Let's just get a feat right off the bat. So you gained the tough feat. In addition, you learned how to adapt to zero gravity. Being weightless doesn't give you disadvantage on any of your melee attacks, which uh, weightlessness is a thing that's described on your DM screen or in other sections of the books. And so then we move on to races. This here is going to tell you basically everything you learned from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. You can speak, read, and write, comment in one other language that your DM agrees is appropriate for the character. Player's Handbook offers a widespread of languages to choose from. DM is free to add or remove languages from the list for a particular campaign. Yeah, most of this is most of this is kind of nothing. But we're just going to go to Astral Elf now. Let's see what the Astral Elves are all about. Long ago, groups of elves ventured from the Feywild to the Astral Plane to be closer to their gods. Life in the Silver Void has imbued their souls with a spark of divine light. That light manifests as a starry gleam in an Astral Elf's eyes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because nothing ages on the Astral Plane, Astral Elves who inhabit the plane can be very old, and their longevity gives them an unusual perspective on the passage of time. Some are prone to melancholy, while others might display an absence of feeling. Many look for creativity or creative ways to occupy themselves, whether they choose to live in quiet contemplation or strike out to explore the reaches of the multiverse. Astral Elves tend to see things through the lens of time as having little or no meaning to them. Astral elves who don't dwell on the astral plane can live to be more than 750 years old. They kind of remind me that, I mean, so much of this is, I can tell they're yanking from popular culture. And I just instantly think of the Vulcan. Especially when they talk about like not having a lot of emotion. They're like, yeah, here's your excuse to make your version of Spock. Which I may go and do because I do intend on making some videos where we uh, we create some characters based off of these new races, and I want to fit them to closer to archetypes out of popular culture. I think that'd be fun. You get your typical. You're a humanoid. You have 30 feet of speed. You're medium. Astral fire is the first interesting thing you get. You know the following cantrips of your choice, Dancing Lights, Light, or Sacred Flame. Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma is your spellcasting ability for it. Choose when you select this race. That is nice. You can choose what it is. your uh, ability modifier is. I get the feeling most people are going to go for Sacred Flame because you already have Dark Vision. Most DMs don't rule Dark Vision the way it's supposed to be, so, you know, why waste your time with Light? So yeah, you get your 60 feet of Dark Vision, you have Fey Ancestry as typical, Keen Senses, another elf typical. This is new, like I, I said in the previous video, Starlight Step, which is nice. It's pretty cool looking. As a bonus action, you can magically teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space you can see. You can use this trait a number of times equal to proficiency bonus 
and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Astral Trance is the next one, but that's uh, it's it's kind of like having the uh, Fey touched part of the Fey touched uh, feature from Tasha's, except you just don't get an extra spell, but you have your extra cantrip right off the bat as an Astral Elf. I love having teleport spells in general, so that's super useful. Astral Trance is the next one. You don't need to sleep, and magic can't put you to sleep. You can finish a long rest in four hours if you spend those hours in a trance-like meditation, during which you gain consciousness as typical elf behavior. The thing, the difference here is whenever you finish this trance, you gain proficiency in one skill of your choice, and with one weapon or tool of your choice, selected from the player's handbook. You mystically acquire these proficiencies by drawing them from the shared elven memory and experience of entities on the astral plane, and you retain them until you finish your next long rest. So just every day, you get to choose a new set of proficiencies between tools and one skill proficiency, which is pretty cool. Auto notes are next. Our interesting little metal gnome friends here. So auto gnomes are mechanical beings built by rock gnomes. Sometimes because of a malfunction or a unique circumstance, an auto gnome becomes separate from its creator and strikes out on its own. An auto gnome bears a resemblance to its creator and most auto gnomes are programmed to speak and understand gnomish. The internal components used in an auto gnome's manufacture can vary wildly. One autonome might have an actual beating heart in its chest cavity, while other, while another might be powered by stardust or an intricate clockwork gears. Roll on the autonome history table to choose entry and like to identify what events set you on the path to adventure. If nothing on the table appeals to you, work with the DM to create an original story for your character. Like gnomes, autonomes can live for centuries, typically up to 500 years. I find it interesting that they even like consider age for auto gnomes to be similar to a regular gnomes because they don't have the same biology. But eh, who cares? Uh, you got your auto gnome history. Your creator was a <clears throat> gave you autonomy and urged you to follow your dreams. It's like miniature data. You got your miniature data here. <laughs> that would be uh, that'd be a fun way to do things. But we don't need to go over auto gnome history too much. You can even just probably zoom in or just pause and take a look at it. But let's go over what your traits are actually like. You are a construct. Your size is considered small, but the new typical coming out of Monsters of the Multiverse is that instead of a 25-foot walking speed out of the player's handbook like typical gnomes have, you have a 30-foot walking speed, which is the same for all everybody at this point, if you're following Monsters of the Multiverse. You have armor casing. You're encased in metal, some of uh, some other durable material. While you aren't wearing armor, your base armor class is 13 plus your dexterity modifier. <clears throat> Built for success is next. You can add a d4 to one attack roll, ability check, or saving throw you make, and you can do so after seeing the d20 roll, but before the effect of the roll is uh, resolved. You can use this trait the number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So you get like several uses of a uh, bless. Or not bless. Well, it's technically like bless, but guidance. It's sort of like a guidance that you just automatically get. And you don't have to declare it beforehand. That's a lot of people don't even realize about guidance. Is you're technically supposed to be declaring that you're using it before the skill check. But this is also attack roll. So this is more like a bless. It's just multiple uses, multiple single uses of bless up to your proficiency bonus, which is another typical thing they're doing now, which is probably going to be in 5.5, is. Uh, Ability, racial abilities being based off of your proficiency bonus. You also get healing machine. If the mending spell is cast on you, you can spend a hit die. Roll it 
and regain a number of hit points equal to the roll plus your constitution modifier. In addition, your creator designed you to benefit from simple spells that preserve life, but that normally don't affect constructs. Cure wounds, healing word, mass cure wounds, mass healing word, and spare the dying. Okay, so they just made sure to add in that just because you're construct doesn't mean you can receive normal healing spells and revives and stuff like that. Which is useful, but that's also cool that you get healing from a mending spell, though it does use your hit die. Mechanical nature. You have resistance to poison damage and immunity to disease and you have advantage on saving throws against being paralyzed or poisoned. You don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. You also gain sentry rest. When you take a long rest, you spend at least six hours in an active mode, motionless state. Instead of sleeping in this state, you appear inert, but you remain conscious. And then specialized design, you gain two tool proficiencies of your choice, select from, uh, selected from the player's handbook. So just automatically get tool proficiencies. I, I kind of want to make a uh, miniature mechanical Geordie LaForge. This would be your typical oh, technician type individual. Let's get a quick drink of my energy drink here before I continue on. So now we're moving on to GIF. Gif are tall, broad-shouldered folk with hippo-like features. Some have smooth skin while others have short bristles on their face and the tops of their heads. As beings of impressive size and unforgettable appearance, Gif are noticed wherever they go. Most Gif believe they originated on one world, but their home world is now the stuff of legend because no living Gif has seen it or knows where it is. The divine beings who created Gif have likewise been forgotten. Their titanic, petrified bodies drift on the astral sea, isolated and unrecognizable in their current forms. Although they don't realize it, Gif are drawn to the astral plane because on a deep psychic level, they remain connected to their creator gods, who have just enough divine spark left in them to imbue Gif with sparks of their own, which Gif have learned to channel through their weapons. Most GIF have no idea where this so-called astral spark comes from, but they feel its presence most strongly when they are in wild space or the astral sea. GIF are split into two camps concerning how their name is pronounced. Half of them say it with a hard G, half with a soft G. Disagreements over correct pronunciations often bloom into hard feelings, loud arguments, and headbutting contests but they rarely escalate beyond that. You're considered a humanoid. Medium size, which I guess is fine. They have it cool if you were large, but I don't think they typically give you large size. Astral spark. Oh, one little thing about your speed. Yeah, you don't just get 30 feet of movement, you also have a swimming speed of 30. Your psychic connection to the astral plane enables you to mystically access a spark of divine power which you can channel through your weapons. When you hit a target with a simple or martial weapon, you can cause the target to take extra force damage equal to your proficiency bonus. You can use this trait a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, but you can use it no more than once per turn. You regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. I feel like you would just... a paladin would be great for this. Just because you just stack, 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 stack. You know, you get all your smites and stuff, and then you just add on that little extra. You just add on a little extra with your astral spark. You do gain firearms mastery, though, which is awesome. You have a mystical connection to firearms that traces back to the gods of the gift, who delighted in such weapons. You have proficiency with all firearms and ignore the loading property of any firearm. In addition, attacking at long range with a firearm doesn't impose disadvantage on your attack roll. And then Hippo Build. You have advantage on strength-based ability checks and strength saving throws. In addition, you count as one size larger when you determine your carrying capacity and the weight you 
push, drag, or lift. Yeah, so I think paladins would be interesting. But you do have that firearm proficiency, so you're probably going to have, like, rangers, arcane, oh, what is it? arcane archer or fighter would probably be another good one for them. <clears throat> but like I said earlier, I'm going to be going over and kind of thinking of some interesting options for space theme subclass class subclass combinations for all these new races so we'll get into more detail then we won't spoil too much but now we're going to move on to the hadozi which funny enough is the race that i'm kind of most interested in personally i had a hard to know anything about them but i don't know this monkey person just seems cool you know who's that great ape hadozi if you get that reference, I love you. Cooking himself a vegan hot dog. The first Hadozis were timid mammals, no bigger than house cats. Hunted by <clears throat> larger natural predators, the Hadozi took this to the trees and evolved wings like flaps, or wing like flaps, that enabled them to glide from branch to branch. Several hundred years later, or several hundred years ago, a wizard visited Yazir. The Hadozi homeworld with a small fleet of spell jamming ships. Under the wizard's direction, apprentices laid magic traps and captured dozens of Hadozi. The wizards fed the captives experimental an experimental elixir that enlarged them and turned them into sapient bipedal beings. The elixir had the side effect of intensifying the Hadozi's panic response, making them more resilient when harmed. The wizard's plan was to create an army of enhanced Hadozi warriors for sale to the highest bidder, but instead the wizard's apprentices grew fond of the Hadozis and helped them escape. The apprentices and the Hadozi were forced to kill the wizard, after which they fled, taking with them all remaining vials of the wizard's experimental elixir. With the help of their liberators, the Hadozi returned to their homeworld and used the elixir to create more of their kind. In time, all Hadozi newborns came to possess the traits of the enhan enhanced Hadozi. Then centuries ago, Hadozi took to the stars, leaving Yazir's fearsome predators behind. In addition to being natural climbers, Hadozis have feet that are dexterous as their hand as dexterous as their hands, even to the extent of having opposable thumbs. Membranes of skin hang loose from their arms and legs. When stretched hot, these membranes enable Hadozi to glide. Hadozis wrap their, these wings around themselves to keep warm. So let's see what your traits are. You are, once again, a humanoid. You can choose between being medium or small. You choose when you select a race, obviously. Your speed is 30, and you have a climbing speed equal to your walking speed. Dexterous feet. As a bonus action, you can use your feet to manipulate an object, open or close a door or container, or pick up or set down a tiny object. I think... As a DM, just for the fun of it, I would say you can do your same monk attacks. You know, you wouldn't have extra monk attacks, but like flavoring, you have opposable thumbs on your feet, bro. Take that sword or do your <laughs> attack with your feet. You know, get some brass knuckles on those toes. Oh. <laughs> uh, you get glide. If you're not incapacitated or wearing heavy armor, you can extend your skin membranes and glide. When you do so, you can perform the following aerial maneuvers. You can move up to five feet horizontally for every one foot you descend in the air at no, mo at no movement cost to you. You can move up to five feet horizontally for every one foot you descend in the air at no movement cost to you. Wait, what? That seems, that seems weird to me. You can move up to five feet horizontally for every one foot you descend in the air. That seems at no movement cost. So how long does that go? That seems strange. And I did see something about like 
Hadozi being able to go at like Mach 5 or something stupid like that with like specific class stuff. So I don't know. I had to look at something online before I really understand how that works. Because that seems to be worded a little strangely. Because, like, you know, your initial, especially like a rules layer, would be like, well, it doesn't use any of my movements, so I can go like Mach 20 as long as I'm gliding. <laughs> and I, as a DM, say, ha ha, no. When you would take damage from a fall, you can use your reaction to reduce the fall's damage to zero. So you just get to, yeah, that's awesome. So you just, well, I guess that would make sense. You would just. You know, you could jump off of like a 500 foot cliff like Keyleth from campaign one of Critical Role, and then just at the last moment, like just unfurl your wings and whoosh, and then land normally. Like, that makes sense. Dozy resilience is the next thing you get. The magic that runs within your veins heightens your natural defenses. When you take damage, you can use your reaction to roll a d6, add your proficiency bonus to the number rolled, and reduce the damage you take by an amount equal to that total. You can use this trait a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Okay. So clearly this is like, you're going to want to be playing Hidozi probably primarily as classes that don't use armor. Like just, I think that's pretty obvious. Though often, clearly you can. But, you know, if you're min-maxing, you're going to play a Hidozi as like, let's see, let's say no armor. Right. Measure rest when you take damage, you can use your action roll. Well, I guess that doesn't. It's one of those things because you'll be playing rose. You just want to be having heavy armor by the looks of it. Yeah, so it's just whenever you take damage. <clears throat> so you could be wearing like heavy armor or stuff like that, but you wouldn't get your uh, glide. So this is one of those races that you're going to probably prefer to be either unarmored, like a monk, or be like a rogue or a ranger with, you know, leather armor, you know, medium armor, stuff like that. But we're going to move on to class points. And uh, I wish I had something to wipe my nose with, but we're going to get through this. We have a Plasmoids and a Thrag King. Or Cream. Thrag Cream. Yeah, that's all we have left for this bit. So the Plasmoids are up next. Plasmoids are amorphous beings with no typical shape. In the presence of other folk, they, are, they often adopt a similar shape, but there's little chance of mistaking a Plasmoid for anything else. They consume food by osmosis the way an amoeba does and excrete waste through tiny pores. They breathe by absorbing oxygen through another set of pores, and their limbs are strong and flexible enough to grasp and manipulate weapons and tools. Although most plasmoids are translucent and gray, they can alter their color and translucence by absorbing dyes through their pores. Plasmoids don't have internal organs or the usual sort. Their bodies are composed of cells, fibers, plasma-like ooze, and clusters of nerves. These nerves enable a plasmoid to detect light, heat, texture, sound, pain, and vibrations. Plasmoids can stiffen their outer layers of their bodies to maintain a human-like shape so they can wear clothing and accessories. They speak by forcing air out of tubular cavities that constrict to produce sound. When plasmoids sleep, they lose their rigidity and spread out and are thus sometimes mistaken for a rock or some other feature of the environment. You have the following traits. You are considered an ooze you choose between medium or small once again. You have a walking speed of 30. This is interesting. You have amorphous, which is great for getting into places you shouldn't be able to get into. So if you ever want to get underneath the door, <laughs> just you're amorphous. You squeeze on under there. You can squeeze through a space as narrow as one inch, provided you are wearing and carrying nothing. You have advantage on ability checks you make to initiate or escape a grapple. Dark vision, you can see in dim light within 60 feet of yourself, as if it were bright light, and in darkness as if it were dim light. You discern, yeah, okay, I don't know why I'm reading all that. Everyone knows what dark vision is. I just zoned out. Hold breath, you can hold your breath for an hour. 
And you have natural resilience to, so you have resistance to acid and poison damage, and you have advantage on saving throws against being poisoned. And then lastly, shape self. As an action, you can reshape your body to give yourself a head, pull up one or two arms, one or two legs, and a makeshift, all right, and makeshift hands and feet. Or you can revert to a limbless blob. While you have a human-like shape, you can wear clothing and armor made for a humanoid of your size. As a bonus action, you can extrude a pseudopod that is up to six inches wide and ten feet long, or reabsorb it into your body. As part of the same bonus action, you can use this pseudopod to manipulate an object, open or close a door or container, or pick up or set down a tiny object. The pseudopod contains no sensory organs and can't attack, activate magic items, or lift more than ten pounds. So, you'd probably, like, that. that's one that you definitely make more use of out of being unarmored. So, like a barbarian, <laughs> plasmoid barbarian, or probably preferably a some sort of monk. Because then you can just use your jelly hands to punch people, which would be funny. And then you wouldn't have to have, like, armor or anything, because you're unarmored defense. So you'd just be this blobby monk that you know can go into places that it wants to whenever because it doesn't have to deal with the armor or anything it has on it just, whoop, just goes right through so that's pretty cool I'll have to think more about what plasmoids that would be good for when it comes to races I get the feeling plasmoids aren't going to be played a lot maybe that's maybe that's a bit much of me to say uh, I guess an angry person in the comments. I think plasmoids are the best part. Every character I create from now on is going to be a plasmoid. But I, part of me gets the feeling that they're going to go the way of oh, the Verdon. Because I thought the Verdon were really cool and I would love to make a Verdon character one day. Which was from... I can't even remember the name of the book right now. I'm a terrible person, but... Yeah, Verdin are hardly... I've never seen another person play a Verdin before. Thrykreen are next. I I remember a story from my cousin about Thrykreen. I've always had a bit of a soft spot for these hard-shelled bug people. Just for that story about how he had had a friend during his 2E days who had said, as long as you have the materials, you can make the character. And so he made some stupidly OP Thrykreen, who back then could basically make an, an attack with every single one of his arms, and then he had like multi-attacks with them. And uh, he defeated a Tarrasque with this Thrykreen, apparently. Now, I don't know how much of that's true. I wasn't there, but I like to believe it was true that my cousin's Thrykreen was built so OP back in 2nd edition that he managed to kill a Tarrasque because of how many attacks he had. And essentially got to... I think he had like some ability like the time stop and he would just make like 20 attacks in a single round and it was like eventually he would crit on a decent amount of them. And, you know, that was the story of that. Well, let's get into what Thrykreen are like in 5th edition. Thrykreen have insectile features and two pairs of arms. Their bodies are encased in protective chitin. They can alter the coloration of their carapace to blend in with their natural surroundings. Although Thrykreen don't sleep, they do require periods of inactivity to revitalize themselves. During these periods, they are fully aware of what's happening around them. Thrykreen speak by clacking their mandibles and waving their antennae, indicating to other Thrykreen that they are thinking and feeling or what they are thinking and feeling. Other creatures find this method of communication difficult to interpret and impossible to duplicate. To in interact with other folk, Thrykreen rely on a form of telepathy. All right, so you are considered a monstrosity. Interesting. You get to choose if you're medium or small. You have a walking speed of 30 feet. And then your first unique trait is Chameleon Carapace. While you aren't wearing armor, your carapace gives you a base armor class of 13 plus your dexterity modifier. And then as an action, you can change the color of your carapace to match the color and texture of your surroundings. 
giving you advantage on dexterity stealth checks made to hide in those surroundings. You get dark vision. And then secondary arms. You have two slightly smaller secondary arms below your primary pair of arms. The secondary arms can manipulate an object, open or close a door or a container, pick up or set down a tiny object, or wield a weapon that has the light property. So that's, there, there is a question about that. I think it's going to come up at a lot of tables. I think there's going to be DMs who are going to be having a problem with secondary arms. Because there's going to be people who are like, well, if they can wield a weapon that has the light property, why can't I attack, 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 attack? So basically, why can't I attack four times? You know, a normal creature can do action, bonus action, stab. Why don't I have technically like three bonus actions? Now, to me, rules as written on that would say, tough luck. It you can only make one bonus action attack. So I think rules as written is going to say just because you have secondary arms does not mean you just you get to just have more bonus attacks. But that being said, you could have uh, in your two main hands a large weapon like a heavy weapon, and then, as say, as like a barbarian, have a bonus action attack with a light weapon from one of your smaller arms. Now, that's something you can do. And then, because like maybe you're raging, you get your rage bonus off of that. And where was. Only difference is, is that whether or not Chameleon Carapace. Because it's your armor class 13 plus dexterity, if that's actually useful to you as a barbarian with your armor, unarmored defense as a barbarian, there's that kind of like, what do you do? But there is that option to think about. You are sleepless. You do not require sleep and can remain conscious during a long rest, though you must still refrain from strenuous activity to gain the benefits of the rest. All right. So you have quite a few character races here that are just like permanent guards. <laughs> it's gotta be lonely being the only dry queen in the the group at night. Like, oh, okay. I'm in a group of uh, just a bunch of humans here who uh, don't talk to me at night because uh, they have to sleep. Pathetic sleeping mortals. <laughs> Drycreen telepathy. Without the, without the assistance of magic, you can't speak to non drycreen languages you know. You can't speak to non drycreen languages you know. Instead, you use the telepathy to convey your thoughts. You have the magical ability to transmit your thoughts mentally to willing creatures. You can see within 120 feet of yourself. A contacted creature doesn't need to share a language with you to understand your thoughts but it must be able to understand at least one language. Your telepath telepathic link to a creature is broken if you and the creature move more than 120 feet apart. If either of you is incapacitated or either of you mentally break the contact, no action required. So that's that section. That's all the character side. I imagine quite a few of you will probably drop off at this point. So thank you for showing up. That's all the races there, but she's cool quickly try and go over some things here in astral venturing in chapter two Let's see what this is all about so you get your speed how spell jamming works spell jamming is the act of using a spell jamming helm described later in the chapter to propel the maneuver of the ship propel and maneuver the ship the individual that operates the helm is called a spell jammer you can travel 100 million miles in 24 hours in uh, wild space or whatever you call it they make minor course corrections on its own to avoid collisions with meteorites so it's basically like having your own starship starship enterprise indeed uh, spell shaming 
jamming ship automatically slows its flying speed when it comes close to something big enough to have its own air envelope enveloped in gravity plane. All right. So it has a lot of built-in features that allow you to avoid things. It slows down when it shows up to, say, like a planet, something has a large gravity. Using a spell jamming helm to move a ship produces a feeling in the spell jammer similar to moving a limb that has fallen asleep. Pins and needles sensation, though not painful, as it's analog. All right. You're going to have duels. Ah, oh, spell jamming duels. What is this? What is this, my friend? How does this work? A ship can have more than one spell jamming helm aboard it, but only one spell jamming helm at a time can be used to control the ship. The spell jammer tries to gain control of a ship by using a second spell jamming helm. A spell jammer duel ensues. Resolve this conflict by having each spell jammer make a constitution check. If the dueling spell jammer is high, have them reroll. Spell jammer with lowest check results result loses the duel and gains 1d4 levels of exhaustion. In addition, their attunement to their spell jamming helm ends at once and they can't attune to any spell jamming helm until all levels of exhaustion are removed from them. Okay, it's a bit different than what I thought. I, I was thinking like, uh, once again, going back to uh, oh, Outlaw Star, having like grappler ship duels. Like, oh, I want to have space-based duels on ships. <laughs> I just want it. So I'm going to have to create it because it just sounds so cool. Oh, we got... <clears throat> Air envelopes, creatures. You got the effects of like air quality, air gravity, overlapping air envelopes. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because I think that this is not really worth the time to go over. Unless people really want me to, you can say down in the comments that you really want me to go over this. So I'll go over it in a separate video. But. You got new spells here. That's actually big. I don't know why I wasn't looking at that earlier. Air bubble. You create an ash or a spectral globe around the head of a willing creature you can see within range. The globe is filled with fresh air that lasts until the spell ends. If the creature has more than one head, uh, the globe of air appears around only one of its heads, which is all the creature needs to avoid suffocation. You can, at higher level, create two additional globes of fresh air. All right, and then create spell jamming helm. Wait, what? Huh? I guess it requires 5,000 gold pieces for a crystal rod, so it's not like you can just do it easily. Holding a rod used in the casting of a spell, you touch a larger, smaller chair that is unoccupied. The rod disappears and the chair is transformed into a spell jamming helm. So you can just create new spell jamming helm. And I love the art that they have for them here. But I think that's yeah, that's all you that's all you get. You get those for artificers and wizards. For spell jamming helm, an artificer druid, ranger, sorcerer, wizard, or air bubble. You get some magic items here: fish suit. This bulky suit, which fully encases your head and body, takes one minute to don or doff. While worn, it enables you to breathe in an airless environment and renders you immune to harmless effect or harmful effects. Of any gas surrounding you, the suit also grants swimming speed equal to your walking speed while underwater, or flying speed equal to your walking speed in an environment with no gravity. That's cool. <clears throat> Spell jamming helm, which is, it's not a helmet, it's, it's a chair. <laughs> it's, you know, where you operate your ship from. The function of the ornate chair is to propel and maneuver a ship on which it has been installed through space and air. Compel and maneuver a ship on water or underwater, provided the ship is built for such travel. The ship in question must weigh one ton or more. The sensation of being attuned to the spell jamming helm is akin to the pins and needles, which we talked about earlier. While attuned to the spell jamming helm and sitting in it, you gain the following abilities for as long <clears throat> as you maintain concentration as if concentrating the spell. You can move the ship through air and water and space. Yeah. You can, as before, up to 100 million miles. That's already been stated before. 
can steer the vessel, you basically get to operate it. And anytime you see and hear what's happening on and around the vessel, as though you were standing in a location of your choice aboard it. So you can basically look into any part of your ship as long as you're there. So it's it kind of works like an intercom system that you see. They, there's a lot of fancy mediums for interconnecting with a lot of like the technologies you see in like Star Trek or Star Wars and, you know your favorite space animes and stuff like that <laughs> Wild Space Orrery inside Wild Space System the portable arcane device automatically tracks the position and movements of all suns, planets, moons and comets with the system projecting a display of all these bodies in the space above its current location in that display, a white pulsating pinprick of light marks the orrery's location. Alright, so it's just another... <laughs> These items really are just here to be uh, translations between sci-fi to fantasy. So you have your star map, essentially. You have your map in the center of your place, and you can see where you are in spell jamming space and see all the planets and stuff. It's, it's cool. We're not going to go over two. I think we're just going to go on to one ship. So. Oh, anything interesting in here to look at before we finish up? A spelljammer can run their ship into another object or creature by moving a ship into the target space and making a special attack roll. 1d20 plus the spelljammer's proficiency bonus against the target's armor class. If the attack roll hits, a crash occurs. Otherwise, the target moves out of the ship's path, avoiding the crash. The DM decides that a crash is unavoidable. No attack rolls are necessary. And the crash occurs automatically. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so there's rules for crashing your ship. Rules for repairing. We got crash damage here, so a large, huge gargantuan tells you how many D10 bludgeoning damage this is going to do. And now you get to look at all the different types of ships. And I'm guessing like these are going to, if you want me to do a video on each individual ship, let me know down in the comments if that's something you really want. Otherwise I'm kind of just going to go over, see, I'm just going to, let's skip, the... let's stop right here. What is this? An autoloid. Uh, these are stuff that Elithid use. So we're going to go ahead and just go over, say, like a Nautiloid. Built and used by mine players, Nautiloids are designed exclusively for space travel. They can't float on water, nor can they land safely on the ground. As an action, a creature attuned to a Nautiloid spell jamming helm and in physical contact with the ship can transport the Nautiloid and all creatures and objects aboard it to a different plane of existence at or near a destination envisioned by the spell jammer or at random location on the plane if no destination is envisioned. This property is a feature of the ship, no spell jamming, not the spell jamming helm. Each time uh, this property is used, roll d6. On a 5 through 6, the property recharges after a minute, otherwise it can't be used for another 24 hours. So that's something you will clearly notice. So these are, it's almost like a spell jamming ship in and of itself is kind of like an item. It has its own abilities, functions, all sorts of stuff. So that's really cool. And I imagine so many interesting things you could do with this. You could have your own space ports, different types of battle tactics you could have for these types of things. They have different abilities, how many people you could have on them. You could collect new ones, upgrade. Your spell jamming ship might be wrecked, but you might commandeer another. Like there's, you know, maybe your ship is kind of low low brow you don't like your ship so you're gonna go and get a different one you know you could invest in a new ship how much is it gonna cost you get a flying fish ship you know all sorts of stuff like that that's so these are cool and i would love to do i'm gonna have to pick one of these to start with as a uh, map build to give out to y'all for free as a little treat so i think that's uh, that's really all i'm gonna do for this what else do they have in here? They have what looks like sort of the gazettes here for the Rock of Brawl, which is cool. Past and present. It goes through the history of the Rock of Brawl. 
Once again, if you want me to go into more detail about that, let me know. Like, if you're really interested in this, please let me know. I'm willing to do it. It's just I'm not going to go through it if nobody's interested, you know? You can inevitably just go pick up the book. But if you enjoy listening to me speak for extended, ridiculous amounts of time, by, by all means, let me know. You know, I'd love to get you all in here sharing this wonderful, wonderful hobby that is D&D. But that is going to call it for this episode with the Astral Adventurer's Guide. I hope you all enjoyed it. And that's about as much as I can say. Look at the links down in the description for acknowledgements for the music, or to get it. Other things like possibly free maps that might come about. So just keep your eyes out for that and see you in the next video.